Hello and welcome to Cherry Red TV and AFC Wimbledon TV. My name is Ian McNay and today with us we have in the studio Terry Brown. Hi Terry. Hello. And of course um, Terry is the manager of AFC Wimbledon and we've had two consecutive promotions with him. And we're going to find out more about Terry's past, his playing past, his managerial past and also what makes him tick as a person. So... Terry, let's go back really to basics um, and your family, your family when you were very young. At what age did you realise you were quite a decent footballer? Um, I suppose from from uh, a very early age, I always had a, a football. I can always remember um, the Christmas presents, the birthday presents had to include a football, had to... Uh, um, had to have a ball, that was it, basically always played with the ball. Um, the I grew up in a, a council estate in Southall and um, we had a park round the corner, an incredibly happy childhood with fantastically loving parents and a, a close family. Uh, family's always meant everything to me, yeah. um, whether it's now my existing close family or you know, my brothers and sisters, we are very, very close. Um, I think it gives you... The security to to go on and do things in in life. My father took me to football every Saturday uh, with my brother, and we would go to always non-league. Me, me, mother and father. Funnily enough, although I'm not sound it, uh, are from Newcastle and Sunderland. So dad was a, a proper Geordie and would not be too happy if he was alive today to see where they are as a club. Absolutely. Um, Mum was Sunderland, obviously. Um, we, you know, my father took uh, myself and my brother to non-league football on alternative Saturday, so we would go to Southall one Saturday and Hayes the following Saturday. And uh, I grew up supporting both of them rather than really growing up supporting a professional club and to this day really um, I look for normally the clubs that I've been at and um, look for their results prior to looking to Man United or Chelsea. So it's unusual to meet someone that hasn't actually supported a bigger club at some stage. Sounds like you haven't there. No, I think I well I definitely did flirt with uh, Man United as a as a youngster and and I actually went to the European Cup final at Wembley in '68 I think, um, and I I watched a number of Man United games that year as a very impressionable teenager and what a side to watch you know George Best, Bobby Charlton, Dennis Law. The list went on and on and on, and uh, um, Matt Busby being the icon that he is, and I think from that day I always really thought that football was about getting it down on on a good pitch and passing it to each other rather than launching it up the park. So at school you were obviously a pretty decent footballer, and I think you were a forward, is that right? Yeah, I played uh, in, in, as a, a schoolboy, played in midfield, played... Uh, in the Ealing district side, right. which um, a West London boy played alongside Steve Perryman, who was miles, miles better than me, I might add. So at that age, I'm thinking, blimey, I'm nowhere near as good <laughs> as Steve. And we played with a guy called uh, Robin Friday, who I then went oh, on... Reading, wasn't he? Yeah, I then went yeah. on to play with at Hayes. Yeah. And uh, what a player he was. And uh, I think there's a book been written about him. Yeah, I've read the book. He's a real legend, uh, oh, Robin Friday. Oh, just... Yeah. I mean, he's an talented, yeah. yeah. He's an Acton boy. And yeah. uh, uh, the most talented individual that I've ever seen. And... Um, and some, um, I mean, I could tell you millions of stories. Very unstable about character there, wasn't he? Yeah, unfortunately, he, he died at a very early yeah. age. Um, mad as a hatter in the best possible way. Um, brave, like you couldn't imagine how brave he was on and off a football field. He, he, he had no fear and he didn't have a fearful bone in his body, but he had amazing talent. Yeah. And, um, and it also led me on to... Um, managerial like the way that my manager handled Robin at Hayes was incredible he was um, the manager was Bob Gibbs at Hayes and uh, as a young player um, he was my first ever manager and made a great impression on me because he was a headmaster and a justice of the peace and he was used to being obeyed 
very, very strict disciplinarian. Everybody used to call him Mr. Gibbs. Um, the, the real senior players, Bobby Hatt, Les Hartridge, who were top quality non-league players at the time, uh, would were allowed to call him Bob. And Robin Friday used to call him Giblet and Chips. <laughs> um, so, and I could never, uh, you know, it took me a while as a young, impressionable teenager to think, how, how does Bob Gibbs allow him to get away with that? Uh, but it was the way he handled it in as much as, here we've got this wonderful, talented genius, and he was a genius, but he had flaws, otherwise he wouldn't have been playing for Hayes. And he, he then went on to have a, a career that went to Reading and he helped them win the, the, the League Division 4 or 3. I went to Cardiff and then went off the rails. But yeah. um, everybody's got a story to tell locally about Robin Friday. But what I remember about him most, apart from being as, of a very, very generous nature for, for um, a footballer, but remembering how Bob Gibbs, the manager, handled this... It was like a hippie, really, um, into all sorts of things that no one else was in. Uh, and yet Bob somehow reconciled that with the discipline. Everybody still called him, I still called him Mr Gibbs, and everybody else did, but it didn't affect that somehow because you had respect for Robin in his own way and certainly respect for the manager who... It was one rule for one and one rule for the other, which is unusual, but... yes. If you've got respect for both parties, it worked. And and I've often thought as a manager myself, and I've had players not quite as volatile as Robin was, and not quite as well, definitely not as talented as Robin was, but I think as a manager you should be able to cope with that genius. And uh, whether you're a musician or an artist, geniuses do have flaws and uh, you need to well, work with them. Uh, my mm. basic business is the music business, so I know all about mm. dealing with volatile, yeah. flawed, difficult, but very talented people, so mm. I understand that. But it seems at an early age, because we just skipped now to obviously when you were playing at mm. Hayes, um, you were kind of picking up tips from your current manager, so one day you could maybe use those in a practical way. Were you aware you might end up being a manager at that young age? No, at the, at the time I was desperately keen to be a professional footballer. I right. think I had trials at, at Fulham. I remember playing at Craven Cottage. I remember playing at Stamford Bridge in trials where, you know, I'd got to that last level of pick and, and I was never really good enough. So I suppose that automatically changed. Once you've got a passion and a love for football that I have, and I, if you speak to my wife now, it's, it's all I ever talk about. And uh, is that right? Really, it is. Yeah, yeah. and uh, it is my life yeah. um, alongside my family, obviously. And um, I suppose subconsciously, I was getting rejected as a, a player, thinking, "Why is he better than me? What what can I do about my game uh, to, to make?" to make me better, how can I improve my game? Um, I don't think I was disciplined enough, both verbally as a player. I was, to be honest, a pain to work with as a player. Long, So lanky. when you say a pain, what do you mean by that? Well, I love football, but I was um, not the... Um, not the best on the park for discipline. I used to get sent really? off and booked. Because you're very strict on that. Yeah, least, I am you? now, yeah. and I, I'm yeah. a completely changed. I would not yeah. tolerate me as a player in a million years. I would not <laughs> tolerate me as a player. Right. Um, right. Nothing about my game do I do I look back on with with too much pride. In as much I think, yeah, I could have built my body up better if I'd have known yeah. what we know now about. Um, what you eat, what you drink, uh, how you lead your life as an athlete. I've never done any of that. Yeah. And to be fair, my generation never done any of that. Even the, the players that done well had a drink culture. Yes. Um, so, so you were arguing with referees and things? Oh, it was shocking. Absolute pain. I was always getting sent off for elbowing people. Really? Or, or yeah. Kicking people. And in those days, as a forward the centre-half was allowed to obliterate you at least three times and then you'd moan at the ref and he'd go, all right, cut it out. But the the game has drastically changed. I was skillful, but I had no pace. Um, and I just used to get lumped from pillar to post. In At the time, the big size in, when I was first playing, were Hendons and Enfields, the North London Giants. And uh, there was no conference as such. 
with no real feed into the football league. As you know, as Wimbledon found out, they finished top of the Southern League That's for right. yeah. for years and years, and you know were waiting to get elected. A farcical right. yeah. situation. Yeah. Even to this day, there's still a tourniquet there that stops um, three or four clubs going up, or maybe three clubs I think should go up. Um, and they and they've always fought against that the football league, haven't they? And they've kept decrepit, useless, corrupt teams who who can't manage their finances in the football league at the expense of well-run clubs. And and now there is a genuine respect for the conference, and there is a genuine um, belief that you know that the Lutons of this world should come down. Um, it won't be easy for them. Sort your finances out, sort yeah. your club out, and go back stronger. And Carlisle have done that, and several clubs have done that. Clubs have. Yeah. Just, just, just to stay, so we stay in sequence. So, so you, you, you play, you play, you're playing at Hayes, and you presume you're you're, you're part time there, yes? Yeah, I was a gas fitter. Yeah, you're a gas fitter. Yeah, apprentice gas yeah. fitter. My, my, my father, quite rightly said, you've got to have a trade, son. If you can't be a professional footballer, be a you need a trade. I went into gas fit and I was the worst gas fitter that, <laughs> that North Thames Gas ever had. I fouled me sitting gills. I was useless. And yeah. to be fair to my parents, he was doing the best thing for me. I had no qualifications coming out of school, young lad, 15 years of age. Um, a trade was what you sent your, your lad into. Um, and I respect my parents for that, but I was used to say it. Yeah. Um, and I'm still the most cack-handed. My wife, if I dare to mention DIY, she she goes into a, a state because I could ruin the house in no time at all. I'm yeah. not practical manually at all. Um, and, um, yeah, so the, the, the good news was I was able to... Um, work and have a supplementary yeah, wage through, with, through with, football, yeah. with football and that to me is utopia in non-league football and, and we're just as a club now going past that level where we're trying to attract full-time players so what, what kind of play, were you kind of more like a Danny Kebwell or a, or a John May what kind of forward were you well nothing really I, I, I wasn't as good as either um, I used to score goals I was lazy yeah. greedy um, six foot one, but not very good in the air. Um, well, lazy and greedy are quite good attributes usually for a striker. for a goal scorer. Well, and yeah. I used to, I did find out at an early age that uh, when I was young and, and when I was at Hayes, I wasn't lazy. I used to run about yeah. like a, a headless chicken, run everywhere, sprint everywhere. Never had pace, but work what my socks off. I never used to score a goal. Um, and then as I got a bit older into my twenties, um, I'm thinking. He scores 30, I score 10. He don't work very hard, I work hard. Uh, and I do think there is a correlation between the two. I think you need to be cool and calm when the ball comes to you, not flustered and tired. Yeah. So th there is a balance to be got there. And, and obviously the best players in the world, the Roonies, work their socks off and score Absolutely. goals. Yeah. But they are at the pinnacle. The rest of us maybe have to make some decisions here. John Main, does he make a decision to... People call him lazy, but if he's scoring 33, 35 goals a year, you're conserving your energy and using it in the right manner. Absolutely. If he'd work harder and score 10 goals, it'd be no good to me or no good to the club. Um, so so the answer to your question is what type of player was yeah, I? Yeah. Um, tall, gangly, very awkward, all elbows and knees, um, but could score a goal. Yeah. And you were picked for the FA Amateur Eleven, weren't you? So you must have yeah, been recognised as a uh, pretty decent player. I played player. at the, the Bank of England Sports Ground, which was like Wembley. I can remember playing there. I remember playing with Charles Hughes, who was the manager, another strict disciplinarian who um, probably didn't like my attitude. I was a leery young man and probably didn't like my attitude. We won three run, I scored two goals. Yeah. And never got another call, so <laughs> that should have told me something, really, yeah. shouldn't it? Yeah. So at that point, you were kind of thinking, well, you play non-league football part-time as, as long as you can and just have a yeah, job well, as a gas fit or what else? To, exactly, to, because yeah. I, I joined my local club, Hayes, who had supported and got straight into the first team. Went for a, uh, a trial with the reserves yeah. one Saturday, 
trained with them, played the following Saturday, got in the first team against Enfield about three weeks later. So it was an incredibly meteoric rise in, into that level of football from yeah. nothing. Yeah. Um, I hadn't played the previous year when I left school, so that was an eye-opener for me. Played at a decent level, earning £3.50 a week, I think, which I might be able to say it now was putting me boot, I think, at the time, <laughs> uh, because that's how things were done at yeah, the time. Yeah. Um, we've moved on considerably from yeah. there. Um, looking, looking really then, in the first year, we beat Bristol Rovers in the FA Cup. And I remember thinking, bloody, how easy was all this? You know, I'd like three pound fifty a week. Three pound yeah. fifty a and week. Yeah, Bristol Rovers. We beat so. Bristol Rovers, and, and, uh. and at the time, Bristol Rovers were a real force. They had, they just won the Watneys Cup, which was a big cup. They beat yeah. Man United in the Watneys Cup, yeah. and they were they had two guys up front, Bannister and I can't remember the other other name. Any Bristol support would tell you it was one of the best Bristol Rovers sides ever, and they come down and and. And we, we, we deserve to beat them at home. Yeah. Uh, and that's my first year at football thing. This has all come easy. Full house at Church Road. And let me tell you, I think it holds five now. There was about 16,500 watching. Yeah. Um, we then played Reading, their local team, battered them uh, and lost the, the replay. Um, I missed a, an absolute sitter, I can remember. Yeah. Um, and, and then thinking, this is great, this is fantastic. This is all at 19 years old. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. at 19 years of age. And then, um, so after that, I was, uh, there was a few scouts that, that come and had a look, and the only real offer I ever had was uh, from Wigan Athletic, who who put in an offer for us. And I remember thinking at the time, a typical... Larry Cockney lad thinking Wigan, where's Wigan? <laughs> um, and and to be fair to Wigan, they weren't what they are now. Yes, you know they were the old fourth division, yeah, probably a, a, they? a top. A, a, I don't. Know, they were either a top non-league or a lower league That's side. That's right. They were probably non-league then at yes. the time. Yeah, yeah. And I remember thinking it was full time, but I remember thinking, well, why would I go up north? Yeah. Um, because I was a very family boy and a very London boy. So. <clears throat> um, that was the only real offer I got. Um, after that, I applied my trade with both um, Slough, who were a big side at the but time. You went to Sutton first and then Slough? No, I went to Slough, Slough first. first. Okay. Uh, I actually had two spells at Slough. Right. Went to Slough, and I can always remember my father. I was getting, like I said, £3.50 at Hayes and doing well in a good side. And Slough come in for me. And I can remember my dad standing by the side of the door, chap come to the door. <coughs> with a, an unofficial request uh, for me to go to Slough. And he said, uh, I was earning £6.50 at a time on the gas board and £3.50 with uh, Hayes. And he said, uh, we can pay you £16.50. And I could see my dad behind the door going, <laughs> <laughs> take it, take it. Because for a young lad, uh, in, that would be 73, 74, whatever, that was like... It was really a good package, yeah. and Slough were a really good club, and I was always ambitious as a, a plough. It wouldn't have been just going for the money. It would have always been, you know, Slough, and yeah, Slough at the club, time yeah. were, were a big club. Yeah. And and um, so I went to Slough under a, a manager called Roy Sleep, um, and I think everywhere I've gone, you asked the question earlier, were you always analytical as in management? And I never thought I was, but... Subconsciously, I must have been because I've taken something off every manager I've ever mm. played under. Yeah. Not all of it good. Um, some of it, blimey, I'm not going there. Roy Sleep was a fantastic non-league player. He was like a, a Stuart Pearce left back at Hendon, England international, hard as nails. Used to used to take great delight in kicking you in training. Really would go through you, wipe in you training. out. Training. Oh, he'd wipe you out. Huh. It it. He could strike a ball fantastically and he would, he'd put you in the wall and make you stand there with your hands to your side. So he drilled it into your face or your herberts or Hang whatever. On. So you had to stand there? Yeah. yeah, your, and, yeah. and he just kicked the ball Well, because he'd say, like, you're either a man or you're not and you, you, you're going to take... Roy Sleep, if, if anybody that knew Roy, a fantastic player, good manager as well. But everything, it was a hard, very hard taskmaster. He played the game very hard, expected you to be hard. Um, and again, um, 
you know, he he was successful as a manager as well, and and he's in an early. I played under such diverse managers that um, I really learned at an early age that there wasn't a, a particularly right way of doing it. You know, you can't say you might look at a Bill Shankly or a Matt Busby and say obviously that is the right way of doing it, but they all done it their own way yeah. and in 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 a different way to other people may would do. And uh, when I first went into coaching and management. It was always along the lines of I'd do it my way, and if if that wasn't good enough, then that that would be the only way that I'd do it. So the first time you got involved with management was that at Wokingham or was that? Yeah, at, I went yeah. from I went from Slough, then I saw a brief spell at Sutton. I hated it at Sutton. I have to say, I Sutton wasn't the club for me. Okay, um, loved it at Hayes, loved it at Slough. Um, just got married at a time, and that's exactly 35 years ago because my good lady and I have been married 35 years. Right. Got young, married very young. She trapped me into it. <laughs> um, uh, and then probably the best decision I ever made in my life. Definitely the def- best decision I ever made in my life. The uh, Then went back to, to Slough, played there, um, won a championship into the Ishmael League Premier lost a trophy semi-final my first time as a semi-finalist as a player to Dagenham who very luckily beat us I remember uh, now they're a good side at the time Dagenham um, then went from Slough in my second period at Slough went back to Hayes under my old manager Bob Gibbs who I can remember I had a signing on for you of a carpet. I can always remember he came around. <laughs> we were just moving house, and he said you'll need a carpet for this, and that was my signing on fee. But you got to choose the carpet, or did he just give you the uh, carpet? I got to choose the carpet. Yeah, that's something. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that was how it was done in them yeah. days. Yeah. Um, it was more labour or something. They yeah, did, which yeah. was fine. Um, then from Hayes, uh, I had a. Another really good time at Hayes under a manager called Bob Gibbs, who taught me a heck of a lot about um, man management skills. I can remember, I can remember one game in particular. Um, Bob had been a very successful Scottish player. I don't know if he's an international. But he's a very very good player. He played for Brentford, captain of Brentford, became manager of Hayes, and it was a very professional setup that he ran, and it was. Um, it was the first time I really understood what sports psychology was. I can remember coming in against Enfield. We were getting beat. Enfield was always the big game. We were getting beat, I don't know, 2 nil at half-time. I, I was being marked by a guy called uh, Jennings, who was became the England non-league manager. He was also the England non-league captain. He was just a fantastic centre-half, had me in his pocket. Um, I ended up finishing the second half trying to elbow him, trying to punch him, <laughs> and the truth of it was he was also harder than me, so he was he was winning that battle as well. And uh, I come in at half time expecting to get absolutely rollicked because I hadn't touched the ball. And uh, Bobby Ross went round one or two of the senior players saying, um, "I think we can tweak that and do a little bit better here and uh, do a little bit better there." And he come to me and he went, Brownie, now look at Brownie. And the players looked at me and he went, did you see that bit of skill? And it, he picked the one and only thing that I'd done right during the disastrous first half when I'd managed to stumble around Jenkins, Jennings. And uh, he picked that and he highlighted that and he talked about that for about two minutes. And I remember thinking at the time, he must know I've had a mare here. He must know yeah. I'm playing terrible. He wanted to lift you. But yeah. here he is talking for five minutes about the only good thing I've done. And I'm not saying I went out and ripped Enfield apart. I didn't, but I went out feeling that like I wanted to play for that man, feeling like yeah. feeling bigger than I come in. And then, and, and if you just look at it logically, and, and I haven't always applied this principle because you can lose your temper and lose control uh, as a manager prior a game, after a game, half time, but I always remember thinking, well, if a manager che- if he'd have come in and said, You're absolutely awful, um, you were terrible, there's no point in being out there, I was already feeling about that. Yeah, that's right. And I would have yeah. felt about that and it would have been self fulfilling. So yes, I would have gone out and been exactly what he described me as. Mm. But he'd taken the time, the effort 
and thought about how to get better out of me by praising the one bit, one little thing that I'd done was right. And uh, if you look at it logically, if you tell someone he's playing awful, he knows he's playing awful anyway, he's going to go out and think, I'm playing awful, the gaffer's right, and it's self-fulfilling. Yeah. Um, if you go... Don't get me wrong, you can't do it too often. You can't keep going in the dressing room and saying to a chap who's having a mare, you're really doing a great job for me, because the rest of the players might be thinking, where's the, you know, where's the gaffer going with this one? Um, but it, it, all of these things have made me think about sports psychology, and I think it's still the most untapped field in that sports science is up to a level now where even our players at non-league know what to eat, know what to drink, know how to rehydrate, know how to live the, the life of an athlete and know that they have their role models. All the role models are that Ronaldo's who strip off and, and, and they've got six packs and are athletes. Yeah. And the top players need to be that. And the top players at our level, now next year we need to make a massive step up. Yeah. So... At Hayes, you became manager, didn't you? Ah, yeah, but in fact, yeah, to answer your, your, your first question, from Hayes, I was sold for the princely sum of £1,000 okay. to Wokingham, which right. um, was a, uh, up the M4 corridor. So I'm the West London boy, gradually moved up yeah. the M4. Yeah. Um, and I joined Wokingham, who were then, a, I think, a Division One Ryman side. Uh, but they were very ambitious that was quite a decent transfer fee in those days, a thousand pounds. Oh, it was. I, I, I can remember to the day getting a thousand pound transfer fee and a thousand pound signing on fee, and thinking, "Yeah, I've probably done, in I've, cash." I've done well. It definitely <laughs> was in cash. Yeah, um, out the gate receipts of the Farnborough game, if I remember right. Um, but it was uh, it was a good move because it was run by a manager called Roy Merriweather, who again managed in a different way to anybody. I'd, managed before Roy was like a general manager uh, run the whole club was full time run the bars run everything in the club he was Mr Wokingham done a fantastic job a lovely lovely man who I'm still friends with now um, he left most of the football 99% of the football to his coach uh, who was Paul Bentz a, a Brentford player and a very very good coach and so you had Roy, who worked very much on on you as a person and, and got you in his family then. I can always remember him using the word family. We're a family. And I still use that today with AFC Wimbledon. We're a family. And um, very much social. During them days, it wasn't just about the football. All of our players used to go out socialising together. Mm. So you'd go out. We were young mm. men with young wives. It, there was a tendency to get married younger then. And we would all go out, and to this day, I've still my best group of friends are all boys that I played with at Wokingham and Hayes. Mm. I still socialise with them now. That's my network of friends, um, and it was very much a beer culture. It was play your game, and then go out with the girls or, or just the boys, and and and, and bond and, and and proper bonding in them days. Mm. Uh, slightly so more. It wasn't organised bonding, but it was kind of. It well, had Roy the would same... organise it. Roy, Roy would okay. go to the level of. I mean, it wasn't quite as professional in them days. He used to pay you in an envelope on a Thursday night so as you could drink in the bar on a Thursday night. Yeah. Now, nowadays, it would be incredibly frowned upon to drink on a Thursday night, but we used to come out of there smashed <laughs> on a Thursday night. Yeah. Um, and then have to go to work on a Friday and then play on the Saturday. Yeah. And we would all drink and they would maybe provide a bit of food. Roy, Roy was a very cunning man. He would, he would just be looking to leave and he'd bring out uh, some sausages with a, some French bread and some chips. Well, what young bloke isn't going to, if you're having a beer, isn't going to yeah. eat that later on? And uh, the whole, his, his philosophy, the money he raised to pay the players... Never used to come from the gate because Wokingham's quite an affluent town that isn't particularly football orientated. You'd, you'd be looking more Reading or Bracknell for that. Um, and he built the most fantastic function room with um, uh, groups playing Christmas. I mean, he would put on shows during the Christmas period of like 30 and 40 days, cabaret and a dinner and things like that. So it was a very social thing there. What I got off of Roy was, you know, how, how 
how he knitted the players together. They, they never wanted to leave. I can never remember yeah. a Woken and player. We got paid less money than other teams. We were very successful. That Roy took the club into the Ishmael League, which is a top league in those days. And um, we, I stayed there as a player. When I finished as a player, I went into a fantastic apprenticeship. I, I was coach of the reserves. Then I managed the reserves and we won the league. I remember thinking, if I'm running this resis, I want to win the league. And I, can, I still have debates now with, with Marcus Gale about Santa Marcus. I'm not interested in run, winning the league. I'm interested in you developing players. I was always selfish and always focused. No, I'm going to win the league. I want to win the league, yeah. But don't, this, don't they both go together to some extent? If you yes, win I the league, you're also developing players, aren't you? They, they do to a certain extent. And uh, if you go back to the great Bill Shankly, who, who, who used to say the only two results he looked for was Liverpool and Liverpool reserves yeah. nothing else bothered him yeah. and he wanted Liverpool reserves to win their league and and there is that and now we look with my younger players what I'm saying to Marcus now really is look I know you could get a load of 24 year olds to play for AFC Wimbledon reserves but and win the league but that's not what we're about we're about yeah. 17, 18 year olds that you're producing the man he's got helping him, Russell Harmsworth, who's run the 17s and 18s, is a winner as well. So I've no doubt. When I ever say to Marcus, how did it go? He goes, won or lost, and he's miserable if he loses. So yeah. there's there's um, a bit of him in me. But getting back to your point, I served a good apprenticeship with the reserves. Yes. The youngsters used yeah. to drive the minibus about, yeah. um, taking the kids here and there. And if we'd done that for two years, became first-team coach at Wokingham and we um, again got in the semi-final of the trophy played Telford lost over two legs to Telford were a very very strong side at the time um, I remember beating Macclesfield I remember some great days there some real great days coaching and that was a fantastic transition for me because talk about learn your trade I was coaching first team coach to the players that I'd played with and were my best mates mm. a very very difficult task absolutely yeah. and um, I can remember falling out with some of my mates well early on yeah. saying I don't think you realise how serious I take this yes I'm your friend and if you want to remain a friend fine but I'll drag you off and I'll kick you out the club if you don't train hard and uh, and you don't do what I want you to to say and from the early days I've always thought that you can only run the club by being a very disciplined club um, whatever club you're at you have to have strict discipline it's interesting this change that's happening to you in a, in a space of a few years and so you were saying that when yeah. you were you joined Hazel originally you were very undisciplined mm -hmm. and everything and you if you focus yourself yeah. more you could have been a better player yeah. and then at some point there must have been a shift changed in you I guess when you got onto the management side you realised that you wanted to be a winner exactly and to that, be a yeah. winner you need disciplined players exactly that as soon as I went into coaching I'm thinking and I was a typical and you do get it the bad trainer who then becomes a trainer and beasts everybody it's exactly what I've done I was the worst trainer at Wokingham I'm not proud to admit that because I wasted the talent that I had by being a bad trainer. Yeah. But as soon when you as you say training, you mean you as a player training. Yeah, you don't yeah. mean training. Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. Um, yeah. Exactly that. So I would always do just about enough. Yes. Um, and as soon as I become a coach, I was the the hardest physical. I wanted them to run up and down hills. I wanted them to, to do work. I wanted them to So were you train aware me. of a change in attitude? Well, I used to get grief off me, me mates who, who... But I mean in yourself, were you aware that you'd pretty much done a full circle? I wasn't really. I, I, I think it was the fact that I was immature as a player. I think I was immature. Okay. I was always a young... I had such a fantastic childhood that I can remember Robin Friday was the same age as me. He was like... 17, 18, going on 24, 25, and I was 17, 18, going on 14. Yeah. I was a very... I was the youngest child, and I was always... Yeah. Um, my sister would tell you, spoiled. Um, and I, I, I don't think I took enough responsibility for for my own life until, until I decided, where do I want to go? Where do I want to go with this football? I don't want to pack it up. I'm finished now as a player. 
I, I ended up with a, a cruciate and couldn't play anymore. So when I want to go with this, if I'm going into coaching, I want to be the best coach and I want to be a football league coach, I want to be a football league manager. Um, where do I go with this? And, and the, the initial thing is, with the players you're given, and at the time you're given a group of players, and I knew most of them as friends, um, I need to get them fitter. It's, it's mm. the easiest way to get another 10 or 20% out of them. Yeah. Um, so that's what I've done. And um, the players used to moan like hell because he was this poor trainer himself <laughs> who then become <laughs> the devil incarnate uh, as a coach. Mm. Um, and we, we'd have arguments about it. And we'd either do it or leave. Uh, and I was very focused and very... Um, I wouldn't have too much banter in the changing room, not as that showed disrespect. It's different. Banter is banter in the changing room, and you will get grief, whether you're manager. And I think um, sometimes, once you've been doing it a while, you know you've got respect to the players. If you haven't got, you've got control of their lives on the football front. So if you haven't got respect, you're doing something pretty badly wrong. Um, you earn that respect. And uh, I think I had the most perfect apprenticeship to learn the game. Look look at coaching the reserves, coaching youngsters. I was yeah. youth development officer. We had some good lot of youngsters come through. Done all the coaching in the community. Took me badges. Became coach of the first team, a good first team with good players. Uh, got over the fact that I was their friend and, and, and moved on from that. And then got an opportunity to become a manager in my own right. That was still at Wokingham? No, that was at Hayes. Hayes. You moved, moved from Wokingham back to Hayes. Yeah, yeah so I, I, we'd moved house to Wokingham. Yes. The family now still yeah. live in Wokingham. Yeah. And um, I got an opportunity to join. Uh, I got, I'd applied for the Hayes job because I was always ambitious. I'd applied for the Hayes job. Um, the year before and they'd given it to the assistant manager and um, the assistant manager it hadn't quite worked out as a lovely man and uh, he'd, he'd left me a decent group of players to work with um, and I reapplied and I think it did very much in football at the time. Derek Goodall was the manager, who is still, sorry, the chairman, who is still the chairman of Hayes to this day. And the reason why Hayes is still going, and Hillingdon Borough have gone bankrupt, who are a bigger side than Hayes. Hendon and Enfield have both lost their game grounds, who are yeah. bigger sides, better supported, was because the chairman's done such a wonderful job at Hayes. Yeah. He's disciplined, he's organised, and if we bought in a pound, we spent. 99 pence and that's the only way to run a club yeah. and um, I got the job really because I was the next Hayes player yeah and you obviously you've yeah. been impressed by what you've done at working yeah? exactly yeah I think that's true but, but, but Hayes weren't doing so well then were they, they were no playing. they were they were down you know, second third from bottom of yeah. the uh, Ishmael League which will always be the Ishmael League to me no, isn't it's now the Ryman yeah. League or yeah. whatever it is yeah. and um I had an opportunity to, to join my old club that I'd supported and I can remember, you know, getting through the interview stage and, and not really being too worried about the money. Um, I had a good job then in sales. I, I, so I, you'd, you'd left the, your uh, Oh, gas yeah, the, the, the gas, gas fitting had left me, to be honest. <laughs> and I'd always... The, the, the one thing I've always been able to do is, is talk and express myself. Yeah. And uh, I had a really successful career in sales with... Um, first of all, Mice and Domestic Products, which was a, a central heating company, so I knew the product and could sell. And then yeah. I went into uh, stationery with um, Pilot Pens, and I worked for Stanley Tools, which was an American company s selling high-quality tools. Loved loved every minute of it. Okay. Was able to, to combine the two, which enabled us to get a mortgage and, and, and um, live a little bit better off than we would have done. And then massive advantages of being a non-league player. Yeah. And sometimes um, players don't realise that. You've got two incomes and you've also got, um, you know, I worked in sales because it allowed me the time to um, spend on football. I've always been passionate about my football. So, you know, 
Sales gave you an opportunity to, to get up very early in the morning, work your socks off. I nearly always worked in central London, so I'd get up 6 o'clock, I'd drive into London, and you could park your car then in London um, with NCP, leave it there for the day. Uh, and to be honest, I'd done a day's business by 12 o'clock, yeah. and then I'd drive back out and, uh, and do my football stuff, do my badges and do everything like that. But... Going so, back, Tony, to when, you, when you joined Hayes, did you kind of have the back of your mind, right, I'm going to take this club, the conference, and do really well in the conference, or were you just taking it one year at a time? Did, no, did you, uh, definitely. I, I thought I thought at the time I could take Hayes into the Football League. So, so uh, you really I've had always, that, 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 that yeah, ambitious I've thoughts, always been yeah. very ambitious, yeah. and it was um, uh, a great opportunity to take on I remember at the time calling it a sleeping giant, but it was never really a sleeping giant. In it's got the infrastructure of the ground, which was a, a smashing ground. But to be honest, that the population in um, Southall and Hayes uh, is Asian, and to this day, the Asians don't watch football. So the gates were what, like a thousand uh, or something. But the, 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 yeah, the, the like indigenous population were basically leaving Hayes and Southall, and um, the Asian population. You know, have basically taken over Hayes and Southall. So yeah. it's not such that it's probably unlike many other places that the, the old supporters were dying off and all the new supporters, the, the youngsters of, the sons and daughters of, weren't living in Southall and Hayes. They yeah. were moving out. They were going to Swindon. They were going to Reading. They were moving out. So you were losing supporters. And yeah. um, we we built up the supporter base by being successful I think the first year there we kept them up second year I can't quite remember I might have finished third then we won the league in about the third or the fourth year we were there and again going back going back there I can remember going back to my first training session I can remember the chairman addressing the players in the um, dressing room and saying this is a very sad day for the club because I've had to sack previous incumbent and um, obviously I'm disappointed about doing this and I'll introduce Terry Brown, the new manager. I remember thinking, Cheek, this isn't a sad day with the club, this is the best day <laughs> that this club has ever had. And I said yeah. that to the players, yeah. I remember yeah. saying, and yeah. Derek looked a little bit mm, like that and because he's a very strong man, Derek. And um, I remember saying to the boys, no, no, this is the best day this club has ever had. Yeah. I'm going to take you from being a poor side into being a winner you're all going to be winners but you'll have to change and I remember doing a beep test which was a bit basic in them days a beep test is like uh, a 20 metre run where it's timed and you get I don't know five seconds between runs and you, you gradually get quicker Seb Co used to use it and get up to about level 20 right. and um, I remember taking my first training session at Hayes and there's all these old legs that have been there for years and they were getting like eights and nines, and I'm thinking, hang on, I could do eight and nine, and I, I got a, a dodgy knee and packed up football for ten years, or five years. Um, and I remember thinking at the time, I've always been, because I, I was a salesman by nature, it's always half full, not half empty, it was, blimey, how great is this? They're nowhere near fit. Yeah. You know, what, an e what, a, what a winner for a manager. You go in a club and they're all unfit. It's, it's, yeah, that is utopia. That is fantastic. It's an interesting statement yeah. you made. You see the glass as half full rather than half empty. Always, yeah. And that's such a key, isn't yeah. it, to it, success? It, it's, it's a key to a manager because when you're depressed, when when you're getting grief from the supporters behind you who are, yeah. who are pointing out how awful your team are playing, yeah. you're watching the same game. It's not as if you're going there with these rose-tinted glasses yeah. thinking, what are they moaning about? They're brilliant. You're there. You're already come to the conclusion that we're rubbish today, and it's awful. Yeah. It's not like you know you you in any position where you want to protect your players. So if if one of the blokes is having to go at Sam Man, I'm not going to have him go at Sam Man yeah. because he's one of my young boys. I know Sam's having a chorried that day, or whoever player it is, and I'll protect them. But you know it isn't it isn't going well. Right. And you know that. Yeah. 
you're seeing the same game as supporters. Quite often managers will say, well, supporters, what do they know? Well, what I'll tell you supporters know is if, if it's the supporters player of the year, I guarantee you that that player will be one that works his socks off. At any club, whether it's Aldershot Hayes or Wimbledon, that's what it, supporters love. If it's a supporters player of the year, you yeah. know you've got a good character there yeah. who works his socks off yeah. for the club. Yeah. Well, that's not wrong, is it? That's the one you want to keep. You want to keep that. Absolutely. Um, yes, yeah, so that's it. So anyway, so you did you did wonders at Hayes, really, and you got them to third in the conference, I think, yeah, in one we, season. Uh, we, we won promotion in a very difficult league. That, that, you know, in them days, uh, the Ishmael League had Yeovil in it. It had Enfield in it, and I've mentioned Enfield loads of times. They were a massive club yeah. in them days. Yeah. And to finish, you know, three places again above Graham Roberts Yeovil was a massive achievement for yeah. our club. To finish uh, in goal difference, we won the league against George Borg's team, who's another legend, um, play, paying, uh, paying much less money on very limited resources, but really getting that family going, really getting... I Jason Goodliffe played for me in them days. Right. Jason writes in his programme notes at the end of this year, um, he's never felt a team spirit like he had at Hayes. Mm. And it's easy to get a team spirit when um, you, you're not paying top dollar. You're not getting the stars in, you're getting bread and butter players to work their socks off, but you're, you're saying to them, if you change with me, we can all be winners. I can turn yeah. you into a winner. You can be a winner. Not I can turn you into one. You have to make that decision yes. to become a winner. You but have it, to change. It's interesting because that, in a way, was the old Wimbledon. The yeah, kind very of much so, yeah. yeah. Overperformed consistently. Yeah. Had yeah. some good players, but never had great players. Yeah. But there was this incredible team spirit. Yeah. yeah. And, and that's what a lot of the Wimbledon fans love, mm. is a team with spirit yeah. that are committed yeah, I think all, I think all fans do, and mm. in particular Wimbledon probably more so because they had the epitome of that, didn't they? They had that wonderful underdogs yeah, who, who right. continually overperformed. So, yeah, the, the the best we ever done was the um, win against. Sorry, the finishing third in the conference. No playoffs in them days, so we didn't have the opportunity to go in the football league. Um, from them, really. We had a situation where, as a manager, I felt powerless. I was at a great club with 100% backing off of my directors and the supporters. I could have probably had a job for life there, really. Um, in a situation where all my best players were nicked at the end of every year. That year, I think we lost seven players. I lost like, Warren Kelly, who our supporters would know Warren Kelly. He was my skipper at Hayes. Um, we lost him to Stevenage. Um, we lost loads of players to Stevenage, and it used to drive me mad. We had no way of keeping our best players because all the best teams in the conference We're coming used to come in and yeah. nick our best players. And it's I was there nine years. It became soul destroying uh, to continually lose my best players. These weren't, you know, just my best players. Jason Goodlis was captain of England. Mm. You know, he didn't. You know, he was the best player in the best centre half in the league. Warren Kelly was the best centre half in the league. It, um, I continually lost the best players in the league and didn't get any money. It was okay when we were getting money, um, we and we sold. I think I probably we turned over five or six hundred k uh, above the Les Ferdinand money that we got. Um, we were a real wheeler dealer club that that sold and and brought in young players and and sold on. Um, but it became it became the situation where we were no longer getting money for our players. They were going out of contract, um, and then we were having to go into tribunals, and we were getting threes and four thousands for Jason Goodlist instead of what we should have been getting thirties for them yeah. because they they were actually players who were capable of playing football league, but had two jobs. So kind of it was coming to an end there for you, and yeah, and, and, and that did, 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 was yeah. the oldest shot. Job offered to you, or it did came you... out of the blue, really. Right. I have to say, um, I it was a uh, I was phoned up by um, Victor, uh, a friend of mine who then went on to he's now manager of Walton Casuals and uh, he was chairman at Farnborough. 
Vic Sell. Uh, Vic, Victor Sell, yeah. yeah and him. Victor rung me because I'd done some business and I bought a player at Hayes off of him when he was chairman of Hampton, I think Barry Moore. And I'd done some business with him and Barry Moore went on to play for, for Wimbledon. And uh, had an amical arrangement, used to chat to him and he, he said, the old shot jobs are valid, why don't you put him for it? And I went, no, I'm really happy at Hayes. I'm... I'd never thought about going anywhere else, really. I'd, and and it, after nine years, it was, where am I going with Hayes? Um, mm-hmm. I do feel there's a, a certain time limit with a manager, um, and it's based on success, really. Uh, Ferguson has a massive time level because he continually wins. Wenger now, unless he starts to win soon, his time will be it's up. Big pressure. No matter how good yeah. a man, and I think yeah. Wenger's a genius. Yeah. And he's turned around around that Arsenal club, built them a stadium and done so on no money now. But that won't count for anything. If you don't start to yeah. win things, there is a time period. And um, I'd come to the end of that time period with, yeah. with Hayes, really. It was the right time to move. Timing was awful, absolutely awful. It was the only real time where... Well, it wasn't the only time. We'd had some relegation um, seasons where it was hard to stay out of relegation uh, this was one of them and I I didn't leave at the best time but if you're an ambitious man who wanted to go full time professional manager which is what I wanted to do and all the shot were offering you full time exactly yeah. yeah and to be fair I was full time at Hayes yeah. I'd packed up my sales job but I was also commercial manager yeah. and used to do functions and various things with the bar and try and sell the boards around the ground and still a lot of boards around that ground that I've sold right. by the way um, so and that's not the easiest task in the world yeah. non-league doing the commercial and it was a vehicle to get me in the football league it was a vehicle uh, that you know I'd, I'd, I'd proved that I could wheel and deal I proved that I could um, be successful on small budgets but how far can that club go and um, can you manage at a higher level with a far greater expectation, far greater pressure? Um, and I wanted to take that opportunity. And uh, So I, when you got there, Stuart Cash, who you're working with now, was there? Yeah, I got lumbered with him. Absolutely <laughs> tucked up like a kipper with him. Um, and you, you knew Stuart before? I knew him, but not brilliantly yeah, well. Uh, I I'd, I'd uh, spoke to him as new as a player. Uh, he was a nice, affable enough lad. And um, wasn't... You know, on on regular speaking terms with, but when I went to the interview, um, uh, the one thing I'm not is absolutely stupid, and you get vibes from the board, yeah. and one or two on the board, Stuart was going for the job, <coughs> one or two on the board, were very pro Stuart, as in you can you know is Stuart going to get it? Is I'm gonna, am I going to get it? Because he was caretaker manager, yeah, and um, I was asked on the second interview. If I would consider working, um, you know, Stuart working alongside me, because he knew, and it was, it was put to me in a, in a way that I thought hmm, I could get this job if I said yes to this. Yeah. And uh, I'm thinking, well, I had a, a right hand man at Hayes, but I knew Willie Wordsworth. I knew that Willie really wanted the Hayes job, so I'm thinking, well, rather than take Willie, let Willie have his. You know, it's his dream and take over for me there, which was great. And I thought, well, I know Stuart. I know I can work with him and I can trust him. The trust is everything in football. Um, it's the one thing alongside character when you're ticking off things on players. Um, trust is massive in my world. Um, I knew I could trust him. I knew that, OK, he's putting him for that job. A lot of players would put... A lot of people would put him for a job. Would you want that man... Is your second man in charge, your right hand man? Um, in a lot of cases, the answer would be no. I knew, having spoke to Stuart, that he had a really good job, and he's got a fantastic job as like a director of a uh, a company. And it would be mad to to drop that yeah. and go full time. So I knew that would work. Um, so it was initially, it was a selfish point of view. It was 
I can't lose with this one. He knows the current playing staff. Because there was over 50 applicants for the job, apparently. Yeah, and and so. there were some fantastic, I can yeah. remember, and I won't name names, but some yeah. of them were a lot more high, high profile than me and they'd been there and done it. Yeah. Um, I can remember turning up, but the, the, the ex-chairman, Carl Prentice, tells a story that everybody turned up in um, a suit and tie and I turned up in a tracksuit because I'd been training mm. that day. Yeah. And I turned up in my work... Want the posh track suit with it was my working gear. And I turned up in my working gear, and it wasn't really a conscious decision. I'd been working. Yeah, sure. um, but sometimes your subconscious works. Well, I was quite happy because I wasn't... I was no young, longer that really young buck. I was... A manager, but I wanted to tell them I was a, a tracksuit manager. Yeah. I wanted to tell them that I wasn't a manager who wanted to sit sit at a desk. I wasn't a Jeff Chappell manager, and I mean no disrespect to Jeff Chappell. He's a fantastic manager who had unrivaled success with five trophy yeah. funds. We, we, sorry, yeah. we need to yeah. move through it. Okay. Um, so, with all the shots, you, I think you got promotion the next season. You won the Ryman. Premier the next season, didn't yeah. you? Yeah. Canvey Island with his kind yeah. of with the second team and mm. you you beat them away towards the end of the season and so I think I think all the shot had been in their Ryman Premier for four consecutive seasons mm. before that. So they were desperate to get out. Yeah, the, the the scenario to be honest, Ian, is identical to, to Wimbledon's in as much as stagnated in a league that they know they should really yeah. be getting out of. Yeah. But let me tell them that Ryman League is not an easy league no, to get absolutely. out of. And an identical scenario that almost, if, if you look at Jeff King and Glenn was at Canvey Island then, and Jeff King was at Chelmsford. So uh, an identical foe and a very stiff opposition to, yes. to get up against. And... Um, I think in those days, though, it was just the one place there wasn't playoffs in the Roman Premier. No, there was. That's perfectly true. You had to yeah. win the thing. That's right. Um, which puts its own pressure. It's, yeah. it's fantastic now you have the playoff system yeah. able to get in. Um, so anyway, you got you got all the shop up to the uh, the conference in your first season. Yeah. You got uh, to the playoff final, didn't yeah, you? Yeah, the first season. <laughs> Again, if you look at the the... the Scenario is very similar to what we're experiencing now. We've had two promotions back yeah. to back, and going into the conference, not blind. I, I know loads about the conference, but going into the conference, I was blind. In well, I wasn't blind in those days because I'd had the experience with Hayes. I got them into the conference, but no way did I think that we would. We sat down, Carl Prentice and I, all the shot and said. Let's build a very young side, exactly as we're doing now. Let's build a very young side that's capable of going into the Football League. That young side hit hit the season running and uh, just one game after game after game playing, really attacking 4-4-2. I played with two wingers in them days. 4-4-2. Yeah. Uh, I'd got players to the club, youngsters, Nick Tim Seals from Kingstonian, Nick... Roscoe Desane from Woking nicked um, Adam Miller from wherever I nicked him from nicked all these players have gone on to play yeah. pro football you didn't know that at the time you just nicked your best young players that were in non-league at the time and went come here sell them a dream this is where we're going we're going to the football league yeah. they hit the ground running um, but you had the good, you had the right instincts you found the right players that's the, yeah we that's did the and, and that's that's the beauty of management yeah. and it's it, it you kid yourself about coaching. Yes, coaching's important. Of course it is. Mourinho's the best coach. Or supposedly one of the best coaches now. He's a brilliant coach, but he also has the best players to work with. You know, you can be the best coach in the world. If you've got Dross to work with, you'll end up playing like Dross. Yeah. Um, I've always used the same criteria. I want hungry players who are desperate to be pros, who, who I haven't got to worry about motivating. They motivate themselves. The undressing room motivates itself. I'm picking carbon copies of those players we picked at Aldershot. Now I'm presently in the process of interviewing players and the biggest ticks in all the boxes, young, athletic, hungry. Uh, a box I tick now, a box I look to tick now that I never used to tick, uh, is intelligence. 
and, and that's really nicked off of Arsene Wenger. Arsene Wenger's second box he checks is his intelligence. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it's not something, you know, without, without being rude, intelligent. Like Wayne Rooney has a real intelligence on the football field. He makes intelligent runs. Um, without being disrespectful to, to Wayne, you, put, you, you maybe wouldn't pick him in your quiz team. You maybe Mensa. Maybe that isn't isn't someone you'd automatically say is of high intelligence. And please, I don't mean that in a disrespectful no, what manner. Saying, yeah. What I mean yeah. is that Wayne Rooney on a football pitch is probably the most intelligent footballer out there. He's yeah. a brilliant, he's a genius out there on a football pitch. Uh, and I want that. I don't want someone who can't grasp what I'm trying to get over tactically because they have to take it on board. So just to go back to finish the all the shop story, so you you lost in the playoff final the first season uh, playing at Stoke City's ground against Shrewsbury, lost three on penalties. The next season you took again to the playoffs and you lost in, to Carlisle in the playoffs. Yeah, so we the did. Final penalties. Yeah. And the following season your, your wife became very ill and you... And that was one of the reasons why you left all the shop, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, um, Susie developed uh, acute myeloid leukaemia. And at the time, that was a, I'd been there sort of th- three and a half years probably, um, that was a massive blow because I Absolutely. still had a, a yeah. young family as well. Yeah. Um, my son has got severe learning difficulties. So my wife, bless her, has brought up a, a perfectly able... 23 year old daughter that went through university and and suffers all the trials and tribulations of a normal young girl going through teenage and and going to university Um, with a husband that's very rarely there because I'm always at football especially in the evenings so she's more or less single handedly brought my two kids up and I have to say that and most football managers unfortunately you need a, a you need a really caring woman at home and yeah. I've got the best wife in the world so and and to suddenly find that uh, you know she was literally you've got acute myeloid leukemia you're in hospital for a year yeah. like bang in hospital and it's um, a shock our son was we had to arrange for our son to go into care and uh, that is the most uh horrible experience you could ever dream of, of doing somebody you, you you just look to look after your kids all their lives yeah. don't you mm-hmm. and um i'm as weak as anything you'll hear my voice go i'm as weak as anything when it comes to elliot because it's still in the back of my mind there's that thought of couldn't we have kept him at home couldn't we kept yeah. him? And, and the truth is he's now in a fantastic uh home where he goes out doing lots of sports, he goes out leading a much better life than he would do at home. And and, and the bottom line is we couldn't cope yes. as a family, we couldn't yeah. cope. But a, a terribly traumatic time for my daughter. You know, whilst that's happening, my daughter's taking her university exams. Yeah. You know, you think, is there a worse scenario here? The team then started playing, started to disintegrate a little at all the shots, started to go. Some of our best players were... We're being taken uh, and moving on. Um, we had a, a catalogue of injuries when we first went pro, where, again, inexperience on my behalf, really, where I managed to injure 13 of the playing staff during pre-season. That's a good lesson to learn, isn't oh, it? The first season you go pro, it's the players that have got to be prepared for it, extra training. Exactly, and they weren't. Yeah. They were part-time players with jobs. I, I made them into full-time players. Oh. The, the wage bill doubled. The committee and the, the director of the club quite rightly assumed that we'd be better than those players that we'd been really successful with mm. um, they might have been if I'd allowed them to, to get fit in a proper time span but I can remember being under pressure by the, the chair and everyone um, we're going full time we're paying them see these are like 300 pound players that you're then paying 600 pound to compensate for losing a job yes. so we'd, uh, our wage bill doubled and we're we're getting worse performances on the pitch. My chairman's then going to me, and my chairman was brilliant, by the way. But he's quite naturally saying, "What's going wrong, wrong here, Brownie? We are we getting them in mornings and afternoons? So we start training them mornings and afternoons. Well, 
you don't have to be a rocket scientist to work out that they're going to be picking injuries up and they were picking mm-hmm. injuries up on a on a scale that was frightening 13 players out of a squad of 18 we were loaning from anybody that would loan and to make matters worse mm. you got knocked out of the FA Trophy at home by oh. AFC Wimbledon oh shocking must have hurt that didn't you um, yeah again, and I can, I can remember the, the game I've got a video of the game uh, Dave Anderson's uh, someone that I knew well worked with Warren Kelly my, my skipper at Hay so I knew Warren well I knew uh, I knew all the management staff there and um, for Dave, it was a massive game that he needed to win, to be honest. Um, from my point of view, we'd been knocked out of the semi-final the previous year of the trophy, uh, a cup which I'd been knocked out as a, a player, a coach and a manager in the semi-final three times, so I'm pretty peeved off about it. Well, you'll win it at Wimbledon, so don't worry we'll about that. We'll win it that. with uh, yeah. the Dons, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, and I can remember the ecstasy in David's, Dave Anderson's face I mean, what a scalp coming to Aldershot on her own patch. Um, the Dons will tell you they outsung Aldershot. I'm sure the East Bank would never have it at Aldershot because <laughs> I've got respect for both camps here. <laughs> so um, all I'd say is Dave won the tactical battle on the pitch yeah. that day. Um, well, the first half, actually, Aldershot was a better team and then Wimbledon somehow in the second yeah, half. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think Andy Little totally at the time around. had a fantastic yeah. game. I remember thinking... Yeah. God, how good is he? Uh-huh. Uh, and Dave got it right in the second half, to be fair. And uh, Roscoe tormented us. Roscoe, we'd let go the previous year because he'd had a whole year of tendonitis and didn't play again. But again, was part of that 13 players that he, he was my leading goal scorer, didn't kick a ball for me that year. Yeah. Um, so the following year, it was like, well, get rid of all those that are injured. He came back and played for you and was a massive influence for you as a good, good player. And a fit Roscoe to say, obviously we made a difference here. I've scored and made the goal, I think, that day. But uh, again, we, we spoke earlier about managers in a time frame. And because we'd set off with fantastic year, fantastic year, fantastic year. And then the, the, the fourth year not quite hitting that we're going full time for the first year and, and also picking those injuries up the fifth year we had just started to rebuild that was my last year there yeah. just started to rebuild the new Aldershot side and that's the side that went up the vast nucleus of that team was a team that Gary took over uh, but and let me highlight it's a massive but Gary took over and took it to another level Gary yeah done a great job at all the shots so I'm not trying to take credit for that team that went up what I'm saying is that the the best way to go up is to build a nucleus of talented young boys right and so we, we covered the story of um, how you how you got to apply for the uh, the AFC women job when I interviewed Stuart earlier so I just wanted to cover some some so sort of not general points but specific things about you I wanted to I wanted to ask you what what happens with you at matches? Because you seem to me to kick every ball, you know. And when we when 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 we are not playing bad, are not playing so well, you get very frustrated sometimes. Yeah, as as a as a young manager, I literally did do that, and I was. Uh, again, I think I've I've. If you speak to Jason Goodliffe about how I used to manage and how I manage now, yeah, there's it's quite a notice, noticeable change there. I still um, I still lose my temper. Um, to to no effect really. There's not there's not much mileage in losing your temper. Um, you need to be that cool, calm, calculating one. Uh, I'm a lot better than that than I used to be, but still get frustrated when, you know, I'm asking them to play football and they're lumping up the park. I'm thinking, or there's times where we'll be one nil up, playing really well, and then sit on the edge of the 18 yard box and soak up a load of pressure. Playing well because you're getting at them and you're playing your football. Yeah. Why would you change? But it's in the psyche of, of footballers. It's in the psyche of young men that then become more cautious when they score a goal. It's not. Mm. It's not in the team talk. It's it's detrimental to the way we play sometimes. So that frustrates you. That annoys you. If players, and and I'd I'd mention the role Tom Davis had last year. Fantastic year for us. A great player. Yeah. Loads and loads of pluses. I could frustrate an angel for heaven's sake with the same things he does, petulant behaviour that he does wrong, 
which I know we'll pay the price for. Um, so, yes, I still kick every ball. Not as bad as Cashy, to be honest. I try and sit down more. Yeah. I try and avoid that. Chris gets the ball and uh, Chris look up, play that, play that, play that. Because you know, if they can't play, if they can't see a pass out, if you've got to tell them where the pass is, they're not good enough, and you're not doing your job properly. Um, do, so, do, do, do you worry? Do you worry at home about it? Do you lay awake in bed at night? And if we lose, I have a terrible Saturday. If we lose, do you? Yeah. Uh, an absolute terrible Saturday. I used to. Um, I've always um, gone and had a beer on a Saturday night with with friends. And uh, it used to be that if we got beat, I'd, I'd drink I'd drink a bit more. And I don't do that now. I'd, I, if we get beat and I'm really depressed, I'd, I'll maybe have a couple of beers and, and, and leave it at that because I know I'll wake up in the middle of the night on a Saturday at about 3 o'clock and 4 o'clock and that game's going round and round. I won't go back to sleep. Mm. And nothing changes that. Mm. Nothing changes that. It's... Uh, I'm quite often asked, uh, and I don't want to preempt your questions, but I'm quite often asked if I enjoy watching my team, and the answer is no. Um, I'd love to be a lie and say to you, I love watching them. I love watching them when we're three nil up with five minutes to go. <laughs> um, apart from that, it's painful. I get stomach ache when the nerves kick in. It's my job to be cool, calm, and selected, and make them substitutions yeah. and really make a decision. That's right. And um, I'm quite often asked, what did you think of that opposition number nine? What did you think of the opposition five? And unless he scored three goals against us, I would never clue. I only ever watch my players. And I normally are thinking, he's got to do that better. 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 What management skills tell you and what experience tells you, and you can't beat experience, is... It's no good in and it's no good going in at half time, before the game, half time or at the end of the game, and relating negatives to players. You have to balance that with more positives than negatives. You have to make that and again that's experience both as a manager and experience as a player. What worked for me is no different to what will work for other people. People some people say, Well, you put your arm around some and you kick some up the backside. I understand what they mean by that. And let me tell you, most players respond to arms around. Even if they're the biggest, ugliest, pug centre-half yeah. you've ever worked with, if you say to him, you're better than this, you're better than this, they'll respond. If you say to him, you're absolutely rubbish today, blah, blah, why would they? Yeah. You know. One thing that Eric should I should ask you is that apparently you played against Milton Keynes City one time and you scored a hat-trick, is that right? Well done, Eric. You haven't got all the facts right there. I scored six goals. You scored six, six goals, goals against Milton Keynes. We beat Milton Keynes in the Barks and Bucks Senior Cup. And to this day, I still won't drink with Roger Steer because we won 7-1... I should have scored all seven. He <laughs> took the ball off me to score the seventh, the greedy rat. Um, but my claim to fame as a Wimbledon manager is that I scored six goals against Milton Keynes. Okay. Yeah, that's not bad, is it? Absolutely. <laughs> one thing, my last, the last thing I wanted to ask you was that the one thing I really like about, about your whole attitude is it's very ethical. And you've won the Fair Play Award now for two consecutive seasons. And I think fair play is one of the really important things in your character, isn't yep. it? Yeah, very much You treat much so, people yeah. as you want to be treated, which is an, also an intelligent approach. And I know you were particularly upset about, well, we all upset about the incidents at Bromley and at, um, I forgot, at Eastley. Eastley, Eastley yeah. Yeah. And they're things that women and players wouldn't do, aren't they? They are, and it's even, you know, you, you, you take that to that, that the Hampton one, and uh, it isn't a parallel, and it isn't... Uh, a similar occasion. Uh, do you feel easy with things? Do you feel comfortable with things? Is it, we're in a situation now, and I won't go into great detail, where I'm trying to get a player from Hayes. It'd be my first player I've ever took off a club that I've left. Uh, yeah. Do I feel comfortable? And not really. I feel a little bit uncomfortable about that. Sometimes you have to put, you know, I have to put Wimbledon first. I have to put my club first because um, it's the club I'm at, and it's it's where all my focus is. Um, 
I will quite often say to Eric, I'm not going to do that, Eric. And because Eric's very ethical he is. and yeah. uh, has the same moral guidelines that I, I do, he'll quite say, I understand you feel uneasy about that. Don't do it then. And there, there was there was a, an occasion recently, and I, I won't go into detail about it, where we could have done something and it would have benefited the club, but I felt very uneasy about it and didn't like it. And Eric said, don't do it. Yeah. You know, it's a great thing, this karma in life. And I think of the Eastley thing and the intentional handball. And then I look at what happened to them in the playoffs. They were 4 nil up away from home. Yeah, I watched it, yeah. Yeah, and to fourth, mm. playing playing uh, your old club, Hayes. Lost four, they won 4-2 away from home. You think they're going to walk it and they lose 4 nil at home. Mm. To me, somehow that's karma playing its little game there. You know, you cheat, you get found out. Best not to cheat in the first place. Short-term gain really works. Terry, we're going to have to finish. I'd like to go on more. We've been chatting for an hour and a quarter now, which is a long time. But uh, thanks very much for your time. Uh, Stuart's already promised us another promotion this season, three consecutives. So. Oh, well done, Stu. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm only joking. But we're looking forward to this next season. And uh, I know it'll be a very positive season, whatever happens. I mean. And thank you very much for watching uh, Cherry Red TV and AFC Wimbledon TV. And uh, keep looking at this series. We've got some new good ones coming. Thank you. Goodbye.